You remember old building 19 in an old warehouse that was built to withstand Japanese bombs, or German bombs, because that's where we met the, in Hingham, that's where they made landing craft. So the old building 19 was kind of a dumpy place, and it was all, only open two days a week. But Jerry would take a letter and he would put it in the newspaper and then explain what came in the, each week. And then a lot of things came in, so he was open all week long. And he still wrote the letter and he put it in the Quincy Ledger. And finally got to be too much work for him, so he put an ad in. He needed some help to draw pictures. And Rosie saw the picture. Rosie's my wife. And Rosie saw the ad and he said, You ought to go over there. Now, I was teaching school at the time, but all school teachers need a second job. So I went over and I brought over my resume. And I said, Here's my resume, which did not impress him a single bit. He says, I don't care about your resume. I want to know if you can draw anything. I said, Oh, yeah, I can draw all kinds of stuff. He said, Well, draw a picture of that. Um, vacuum cleaner over against the wall. So I drew a picture of it, and he says, well, that's no good. That just looks like a vacuum cleaner. You've got to make an ad out of it. So I went back and it said, vacuum cleaners for sale, and a handy on-off switch. And he says, no, you're going to make it very interesting. And so I showed a picture of Jerry being sucked up into the vacuum cleaner. He says, now, now you're talking. So he says, all right, come. And he, he, that wasn't enough, though. He, we, I drew pictures all that evening during my uh, interview, and I came home and told Rosie, I, this is, he, I'm never going to get a job. He had me working, drawing all kinds of pictures, and uh, I, he said nothing at the end, so I don't know what's going to happen. I'll ne probably never get that test back, but I did get that test back. It came as the circular, and he still owes me for that circular. <laughs> But anyway, we started drawing pictures for Jerry, and it was, oh, I've already said that. Oh, this is it. Um, so at one time, we had these hibachis from Japan. So I draw a picture of this hibachi, and I showed it to him, and he says, well, that's no good. You've got to have an interesting headline to get people to read it. I spent a lot of time making this guy. So I went back, and I put the headline on it, says, from those wonderful folks who brought you Pearl Harbor. <laughs> and he thought that was good. He said, oh, this is going to be a wonderful relationship. <laughs> One time, they had the person who was buying clothing bought sport, sport coats and vests because they had a fire down south in the pants factory, where they made them in two different factories. And the guy leaned over to me and said, here's how we're going to sell them. We're going to tell people that it's a new fashion trend to wear a sport coat and a vest in a contrasting pair of pants. And I said to him, how many people do you know that get their fashion tips from the Building 19 Circular? I said, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to tell the truth. We're going to say, men's matching two-piece suits. So then the guy says, say, did you get your suit at Building 19? He says, how did you guess? These were so successful. In about another year, they had another fire in the pants factory. This is the advertising that made all the difference for Building 19. Now, you remember in 1971, the windows fell out of the John Hancock building. And Jerry called me in one day, and he says, I need your advice. I said, at last, I'm a school teacher. I know everything. And he never asked me for advice. So I said, what's your problem? He says, well, I have the opportunity to buy these windows. It fell out of the John Hancock building. And uh, I says, well, how much are you going to sell them for? He says, well, I have to get $100 a piece. I said, well, let me give you a piece with the box. They're no good. They fell out of the John Hancock building. There's something wrong with every one of them. And I don't know of anybody that's building a skyscraper in their backyard, so nobody is going to buy these. He says, well, it's too late. I already bought them. And it's your job to sell them. Okay, so I started thinking about what I would do, and I thought maybe we'd talk about John Hancock Glass, and that would be cool, it'd sound historic. And as I left the room, he said, oh, and you can't mention John Hancock in this, because I agreed that we would never say anything about John Hancock. So this is the ad I came up with, it's not very good. I cut a picture of a different uh, skyscraper, and I said, we won't tell where these came from. And I went back and showed it to him. 
He says, well, that's no good. You can't figure out where they came from. So I went back and signed the paper as Jerry Ellis, only it was, I can't go back. <laughs> the next day, that ad was on the front page of the Boston Globe. So I knew we were in trouble. I went to him and I said, we weren't supposed to mention John Hancock. The headline, by the way, was John Hancock Glass Sold to Building 19 on the front page. So I said, well, we're in trouble, right? He says, I don't think so. I said, how do you figure? You made that agreement. Oh, yeah. He said, they're going to sue me. He says, but um, the, uh, John Hancock is also suing the construction company. And the construction company is suing the glass manufacturer. And the glass manufacturer is suing the artist. The, the architect. And the architect is covered by John Hancock Insurance. <laughs> so I don't think we'll see the inside of a courtroom for another hundred years. <laughs> so anyway, the, um, it was a great thing. We didn't sell many of them. I went to, I had a group like this one day and I asked, did anyone ever buy one of those windows? And the lady in the house <coughs> said, yes. I said, what did you do with it? She said, we put it in our attic. I said, that's wonderful. You opened up your attic and put it in a skylight, added to the room in your house. You have a place for the kids. Now she said, wait a minute. No, we put it in our attic. You want it back? <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing about it is that it went from the Boston Globe. It went all over the country. And they figured out, the sellers figured out that there was a guy in Ham that would buy damn near anything. So we got a call from a guy that said, I have ride-on lawnmower that you can sell for $80 and make a profit. Ride-on lawnmower? He says, yes. He says, I'll buy every one you've got. And he did. They were ride-on lawnmowers that were on a bicycle. And if you had to lawn, mow a lawn the size of this room, it would take you approximately two weeks. It was, it would, you, but you would be in wonderful shape afterwards. Well, we had a lot of ways of advertising. We advertised in a circular that you saw, in, they came out in the Globe and the Quincy Ledger. And, and so these, this is the first one I, one of the ones I wrote. And it was taken from an old Yiddish joke. The joke is, why did God make so many Goyish people, which means non-Jewish? So I had to change it. How, how, how come, how did God make so many stupid people? And Jerry, of course, says, somebody's got to pay retail. We had a unique way of announcing the opening of a new store, which went over good. One year we got these, I don't know, house coats. Now, I don't know if any of you people wear house coats anymore. I don't, when I was a kid, my mother always used to wear them. And every woman had a house coat. And it was more stylish than an apron, but it was just about like an apron. And we got these um, house coats, and I made. We, and my mother used to call them home dresses because they came out during the depression. And uh, so we put this in. But I also added a speech from President Hoover. You can't read that, but it says, "My fellow Americans, it's my firm belief." Prosperity is just around the corner. And until that time when America expects to have two cars in every garage and a chicken in every pot, and the least our great nation can do is properly clothe our women folk. Accordingly, I have asked our country's fashion experts, who in my opinion are the best in the world, to design a simple yet stylish frock for the ladies of our great nation, an inexpensive working dress that will conform to our Christian standards of modesty yet allow the fair sex the freedom to accomplish the calling that has traditionally been theirs, caring for the American home and its babies. Well, the fashion lady who bought these things, I'm storming in and says, that's no good. You can't do that. It's, it demeans women and you will never be able to sell them. This is awful. Well, of course, we sold them out. She said, I don't care if we sold them out, I didn't like the ad, never do that ad again. And of course, within two weeks, we bought some more. And I couldn't, I couldn't do it again, so I went to my uh, Fredericks of Hollywood catalog that came in the mail, and I used some of the models. And there we are, it says, Saucy Ladies Coffee Coats, they call them. Binkies, the kind men like. 
At the bottom it says, they slip off all the way to the floor. <laughs> and she, of course, Beth came in that next day and said, well, that's terrible. We'll never be able to sell them. Now, this is obscene. This is awful. Of course, we sold them out within weeks. Well, of course, we got them again in 2004. And that was the year uh, 2005. There, there was going to be a, an election. So we had Hillary and Reagan's wife modeling them, and it says Republicans call them dusters, and Democrats call them caftans, and real men wear boxers. <laughs> Jerry occasionally bought fashion accessories too, and this is a wooden tie that he bought, and it was, I call it the flow-through necktie, because the food goes right through the tie and onto your shirt. <laughs> And it's air conditioned, air conditioned to wear his, wear his vest. Sometimes I had to make ads for something I didn't even know what it was. And that's this one. The guy says, I wonder if my fax machine is protected from disruptive and destructive electric disturbances. I, I, I don't really don't know what this means. <laughs> Your worries are over. We, there's a facsimile protector for only $2.99. We keep them. We still have them. We got some. We got some frames. And you, when you buy frames, there's always a picture of some beautiful woman, like Ida Lupino or somebody in the picture. So I took out all the pictures and I added to them. Um, how come that doesn't show up? I'm not. One, the key one down the bottom it says Nana, and I used a picture of the woman from New Bedford. Uh, Lizzie Borden. <laughs> and I have a picture of nuns with guns. And I thought it was good. My theory on ads, by the way, I, I get all the credit for the ads because I draw the pictures, but the best thing about the ads are the words. Words always come first. You've got to have words in your mind before you can draw a picture. So that's my motto. Words come first. For example, the guy that was great, two guys that were great with words. One was P.T. Bond. And you don't have to read that whole thing, but his ads were all full of words until the relatively modern times when it had Bottom and Bailey Circus, when it was all pictures. But in the beginning, he wrote beautiful copy. You had to go see these things. And you also know, you knew when you read it, it wasn't true. But you didn't care. You wanted to go see it anyway. You wanted to go to see, what is this thing he's trying to fool me with? The other guy that was absolutely great with ads, this is in 1956, David Ogilvy. He had the most prestigious ads in the world and one of the greatest lines there ever was to lead an ad. And it says, at 60 miles an hour, the loudest noise in the new Rolls Royce is, comes from the electric clock. You can't beat that for copy. And look at the, look at the copy they wrote. People would sit and read this. Today, you don't see any copy in ads, and you don't hear any sensible copy. If you watch television, and you watch these ads that none of us should watch are the pills they're trying to sell to old people. The, the commentary is terrible. It's garbage. It's double talk. Don't pay any attention to medical ads on television. Change the channel. Here's, a, here's one of my ones that I'm really proud of. It's because the words were great. He was selling these papers that you sit on when you go to see the doctor. You know how they unrolled the paper? You have to sit on them in your underwear. And the line, Physician's Platform Paper Protector Prevents Pages Posterior Pollution. I thought that was pretty good. Here's an ad that you won't see too often where I beg people not to buy it. No, I'm ahead of myself. This is an ad of <laughs> T-shirts, and, and when you see it ad with models, it's always handsome and beautiful people. I got these pictures from wanted posters, <laughs> and the copy says, "This is perfect to wear to your uh, hearing." <laughs> now here, here's a great ad coming up. The the pet guy wanted to sell pet cages. Well. It seems to me that if you were selling pet cages, you should put them out, and people who have pets would come by and buy the cages. You either need a cage or you don't. But I can't read this, so I, I said that 
this is where the place you keep your pet chicken. And that's, everyone has a pet chicken, and that's where you should keep them, because chickens run, that run loose in the living room tend to spoil the upholstery. And uh, so you really need a, a, a cage for your chicken. Well, I thought that was funny, until we got a letter from Weymouth, from a lady who says, I keep my chicken in the living room. So I said, I gotta see this. So I called her up, and that was before the, they take me, took me off the telephone, because I had some hilarious calls. Anyway, uh, we, there was a young girl that came to work with us, a sweet young thing, right out of college, and she was gonna photograph stuff for us. So I said, you wanna photograph stuff? Come with me, we're going over to Weymouth, we're gonna see the chicken lady. And she does, she did, she was a real person. There's the chicken lady, and with her chickens. And she took us through the house, and there was chickens everywhere, and there was chicken dung everywhere also. She was a lovely lady, we were gonna feature her in an ad until we get back and said, you know, if we mention her name, the Board of Health will come and see her. So, I have to just tell you this, and I, we never did put it in an ad. One of the things I'm proud of, also a word that was good, we used the word cheap all the time. Now, no ad at that time would ever say we're selling things cheap. Cheap meant was a bad thing to use. We always used the word cheap. Good stuff, cheap. Have a cheap day. And this is one that tells you exactly what we are. Jerry's looking through the dictionary, and there's a picture of him besides cheap. <laughs> I like that. We also love to use puns. This, these are awful. You get moved for your money. We'll always have a branded med merchandise. Everything we have is calf price. I can get it for you Holstein. Building 19 like no other. I, I won't continue with this. I would, I, people would say to me, I always read your ads. I said, well that's great. Do you ever go to the store? Oh, no, I never go to the store. <laughs> well, the whole idea of an ad is to get you to go to the store. You... And so we made some <coughs> jokes about it. This is how to get Jerry mad in a Boston match. And in the lower, lower right, there's pictures of two people. Do you know who they are? Muhammad Ali is one. Howard Cosell is the other. What? What'd you say? Something about promoting. Howard Cosell. Yeah, Howard Cosell and uh, Muhammad Ali were great friends. This is, if that idea worked once, we'll use it again. The man who told Deadwood Ellis to his face, I always read your circles, but circulars, but I seldom visit your stores. This is what Building 19 is like. The evolution of retailing from a normal person to an ape to below. Now, now Jerry, for a long, long time, had the dream of every merchant, an all-cash business. In an all-cash business, you decide how much money you're going to pay in income tax. You can say, oh, we had a bad year this year, we hardly made a profit. And it was great. But on the other hand, everyone began to use credit cards, so we had to go along with it. So we said, maybe you'd like to charge it. And we did begin to except credit for cards. And as we did it once, we'll do it again. When Grandpa Alice ran, ran up San Juan Hill, he yelled, charge. <laughs> oh, God, I don't understand why these things aren't right. Well, forget that. We're moving right along. It says, throwing out this insert away could cost you $500. And people have to read that because you can save $500 by going to the store. Now, I can't read this one either because the print is too small. But one of the, maybe I can, I don't know. I can't, it's too small. This was an ad, a, the classic ad of a, a person that sells refrigerators to Eskimos. But the thing that I liked about it, and you're not gonna be able to read it because they didn't bring my notes, um, is the disclaimer. This disclaimer has every disclaimer in the world to, to, to the left. One of them was, you can't show this without the written consent of the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> it is approved by four out of five dentists if you regularly...
care, and so forth. Anyway, people always say, oh, maybe you can read it. No, it's too much to read. People always ask, where do you get your ideas? Well, each week when we would decide what was going to go on the cover, we would go to the calendar. So Jerry was great for saying, well, what's coming up? We'd use the seasons. There's spring, when a young man's fancy turns to thoughts of bargains. That's good. The income tax season, where you leave an arm and a leg in there. We've got to remember the dangers of summer. Sunburn, shock attacks, sunscroat, barbecue, where you get sick. Icky jellyfish, giant clams, the Red Sox, and being broke. Yep. Oh, but it, the latter part, we hired two other artists that did a lot of great stuff. And speaking of that, one of them was the guy that did, he came from Century, he was a kid I had in school, Billy White. Um, and he was a fabulous guy, and he was a fantastic cartoonist. He did animation for, in Hollywood. And he lived in Situ, and he was sick, so he, he couldn't go all the way out to Hollywood. And, um, we had, there was a guy from Hinga, uh, from uh, Hull came in, and there was another guy from Moiman. So we had three people at the time. But I did, these are, the ones I'm showing is the ones that I did. Speaking of those guys, we used to, what we did when we did a circular is try to make each other laugh. And so I say that we, I've been unsupervised for 40 years. <laughs> Jerry finally realized that he didn't have to show it to him. We never showed the ads to him. Well. I have to say that he'd go home early on Friday, and we released it on Friday, so he wouldn't see the circular. And on Monday, we had Whack the Monkey Day, where they would all, we would all have to go down to Jerry's office, and he would explain how the ads were terrible. <laughs> and you'd say, and the best one was, he's, we had a, a, a day, and he says, this was the worst ad you've ever put out. He says the sales were off by 50%. I said, time out, Jerry. Do you know that we had a, it was the storm of 78, and all the stores were closed? And he says, that doesn't make any difference. It was a terrible ad. Bless <laughs> to God. So anyway, we would also look at the holidays, like President's Day. And you should be able to recognize presidents here. And I'm going to point at one, and you're going to holler out who it is. Now we know who, can you see that? Who's this guy? George, Abe, Harry, Harry Truman is right there. Who's this guy? Who's this? Reagan. Who's this? Kennedy. There's a hard one. Adams. Got to put in ones that are hard to see. You know who he is. And who's he? Jefferson. Jefferson. Very good. There's going to be more quizzes later. Because <laughs> we did the same thing here. But we got a new one who is? Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, right. I'd like to make it make people think. On President's Day, the presidents come from the, to the store. But that really is true. And we did it again. And you know all those people. Because I, I hate it when on President's Day when they don't recognize the presidents. They talk about all the things they had, like we had. Can dogs get embarrassed? No. The study says no. The handicap that athletes, two out of three athletes, are, are cured even though that your doctor won't tell you about. Uh, bring a little craziness into your bedroom. Especially section on women's underwear. That's, you know, anything to get people to watch it. Of course, we have Mother's Day. It's not nice to forget Mother's Day. Jerry is in the firing squad. Back to school day, where the mothers <laughs> finally got rid of the kids. And I like the expression of the black trousers. <laughs> Another one of back to school where Jerry's in a cage. The thing I liked about this one is Charlie's Angels not, uh, lunchbox. Another back to school where we carved up the desks. You remember those old desks with the iron things? Love those. Another one, back to school. The thing I liked about this, it says, 
who, we all know that thrift is very important. Who can tell me some good ways to save money? And of course, Jerry has the answer. But the girl behind him says, I want my seat changed. <laughs> and Halloween, which reminds me, we did always a lot of ones on Halloween. And I got a telephone call from an irate lady. She said, I did not care for your cover. She says, I happen to be, a, it insults my religion. Oh, it insults your religion. What religion are you? She said, I happen to be a member of Wicca, I, and I, I'm a witch, she said, and I don't look like that. I don't have a hump nose. I don't, I don't fly around on a blue broom. I don't, I'm not all bent over. I'm, I'm not ugly like that. I says, well, then it isn't you. I thought that was a good answer. Anyway, um, and then we had an election right before uh, Thanksgiving. And we had two people that really doesn't look like them because they were new to me, Obama and his wife. We also take uh, inspiration from books and magazines. Unfortunately, I took inspiration from magazines nobody ever heard of. Like, um, you know what magazine that's supposed to be? It's supposed to be the Police Gazette. But it went out of business in like 1902. So anyway, I enjoyed it. Here's what you might recognize. The Weekly World News, do you remember that? That was, that was the one that used to lie to you before the National Enquirer or Fox News came on. They would just make up stories. So we thought it was funny. The aliens invade the bargain store and OJ Neely killed me. She drank too much orange juice and put on weight. Now this is the worst one. I put this in and it says, I, this is not one that's been changed because I made a mistake. Instead of saying, do you drink too much coffee? I said, Miss America drinks too much coffee. Now, put it in, and that night came out, Miss America was the first black Miss American, which was not smart. So anyway, and it says black, six sugars. So I, we immediately changed it over and reused it again. Now the story about this, it says, man eats building 19 hot dog and lives. <laughs> now the guy, we had a hot dog stand in building 19, and the guy called me up when he saw that, and he said, I saw your ad, it says man eats building 19 hot dog and lives. I said, yeah. He says, that's a joke, right? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's a joke. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe he thought somebody died. I don't know. There's another magazine nobody ever heard of. It's, it's a penny dreadful. It's the old time dime novels when they, they used to write stories about the Westerners. And I thought it was funny. Then there's this one. You'll recognize that. Where the wild things are. Now I drew every one of those pictures because I know that you can't read this, but down here it says um, Morris Sendak, and it says apologies to Morris Sendak. Well, of course, we got the thick envelope from Morris Sendak and his lawyers saying you may never use this ever again and never show it ever to anyone, and we used it many times and we never got in trouble. So that was good. I was pleased with that. We also take the movies for inspiration, and again, old-fashioned movies that nobody gets is this one, which was a silent movie with Rudolph Valentino. The Chief of Araby, I had to use it. Jerry also, and at this time Jerry said, he saw the Academy Awards and he saw other people that were using mascots in, for their business, like Joe Camel, stuff like that. And he said, we really need a mascot for Building 19. I said, Jerry, you don't understand. You're the mascot. You don't get it. You're the mascot. He said, oh, no, that's not true. So I threw this one. And it shows all the mascots from all the people. And see if you know any of these. You know who, where's my thing? These people are? You have to be really old to know these. These are the Campbell kids. Even older, do you know who these people are? You probably won't admit it. What? Cracker Jack's in there somewhere, but no, that's uh, Buster Brown and his dog Ty. Yeah, see, we, we know, but they don't. They're too young. These chicks are going to catch this stuff. And oh, you know this one. Quaker Oats, you know this one. 
I don't know, it's was, was all teens. I don't know, the, the baking, you know this one. That was Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid, and you know this one. Elka Salsa and Tommy the Tiger and Pillsbury Doughboy and Mr. Peanut. And that's not a very good picture. That's Charlie the Tuna, yeah. And this is, was big at the time. Hawaiian Punch guy. The Hawaiian Punch. And of course this was a, uh, a video game. Batman, and there's your three snap, crackle, and pop. I know you won't know this one because it was Mrs. B from Bradley's. That was that was our competition many years ago. Also from the movie, so I tried to tell Jerry that he was a mascot. Oh, you know these guys. The Smith Brothers. Smith Brothers, trade and mark. And this guy. Jolly Green Giant. Sorry, you're, you are getting old. <laughs> And you know from this movie? Yep. You holler it out. I'm going to run this like I used to run my classes at school. Everybody hollers out the answer. Who is this from? Casablanca. Casablanca. Right. And this one you have to know. Go on with the wind. This one's harder though. Next one is Doctor Strange. Remember when the guy went up? We took our inspiration from television shows and this goes with the story. Alright, do you remember who? Do you know who she is? Not a bad picture of her. You know, that's Natalie. Natalie Jacobs. Remember her? And this is Dick. Dick, Dick Allen. And you notice it's cold and snow and Jerry would hate this idea for projected bad weather because nobody would come to the store. Well, that same week, Jerry sent me into the Faneuil Hall where they were having a, a um, charity event. And I, I don't know what I was in there for. I think we were signing up for something. Anyway, I ran into Jeff Curtis, who was Natalie's husband, and who was a really nice guy. So I said, is Natalie here? She says, yes, she is. She's right over there. And so I had to go over. Now, Natalie stood about six feet tall. She was a really tall woman. And she was covered with, a, with a, a beautiful mink coat. And I went over to her and said, Hi, my name is Matt Brown, and I drew a cartoon of you in this week's Brilliant Night Scene Circular. Did you see it? And she says, Yes. I said, Well, I have to go now. Goodbye. <laughs> that was my conversation with her. Um, she didn't think it was funny. Um, we have, of course, people that are still on television. And you know who, what's Pat's last name? Say Jack. And who's this chick who is 62 years old and looks like she's 12? That's Vanna. And the joke is, do you know the answer? That's right. Jerry's pretending like he's stretching it out. All right, what television show is this? Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, right, that's good. Very good, because it doesn't look like the guy in Cheers. All right, this one was on last night. Now, here's the hot one. This took me a week to figure out these people's names. What is this woman's name? Whoa, come on, I want to go back. I don't know how to go back. Oh, here we are, I did go back. Good. What's her name? Her name is Carrie Ann Anabin. Carrie Ann Anabin. You know this guy. Glenn Goodman. Good. And that's Bruno Tonyori. And Shoppy, everyone gets a 19. They never get this. You know who this guy is. It's uh, David Letterman. And the, the copy is funny, if, I, if you can read it. Um, it says, let me go over here so I can read it to you. Oh! <laughs> Says, it says, 10 reasons, the number 10 reasons why you should shop in your neighborhood, Billy 19. Lacks enforcement of the no shoes, no shirt, no service policy. Number nine, you always see people you know, but they always pretend they don't see you. 
Number nine, no e need to keep saying, just looking all the damn time. Free coffee preside, provides a welcome wake-up beverage, day or night. Number six, the babes that hang out at the hot dog stand. <laughs> Number five, coming soon, free haircuts. Number four, the free ears pierce guy almost always washes his hands after visiting the West restroom. <laughs> Number three, public address system is a good approximation of the voices in Ozzy Osbourne's head. And number two, the service desk lady has new tattoos almost every time you visit. And the number one reason you should shop at Building 19 is good stuff. So, I'll put myself back together. <laughs> Television ads. Television ads is what, where we get some ideas. And this again is one of those ads, not in your ear, in your face. Here we go. Television ads, when you, asked your, you, when you asked the doctor if Building 19 is right for you, ask him, because he, he's here twice a week. All right, here's one I like. Ask your doctor about shopping at Building 19. Surgeon says, a cut above the rest. Urologist it says, you're in for a treat. The general practitioner says, take two credit cards and call me in the morning. Proctologist says, what does the proctologist say? <laughs> but the one I like best is the one that says, the pharmacist that says, for excite, if the excitement asks, lasts longer than four hours, call everybody. <laughs> call everybody. Talk to each other for a few minutes. Talk to each other. What do you say? Talk to each other. How's that? Okay, now if we can get back on this, we'll be lucky. There you go. Excited line about it. And of course, this guy is the Energizer Bunny, which is Jerry. Um, another place we got our ideas was from sports, and that is Matsuzaka, the first uh, Japanese pitcher for the Red Sox. And I'm proud that in Japanese it says, Good stuff, Chief. Uh, that appealed to probably three people in the world. <laughs> Here is a uh, subliminal halftime speech. You can see it says, close out, surplus, salvage, good stuff, cheap. But what he's really saying is, if we're going to close out, I, let me show this. If we're going to close out this team without a surplus of losses, the season, without a surplus of losses, we're going to have to salvage this game by putting good, Foot, playing good football, I want you to stuff their running game and don't give up any cheap touchdowns. Uh, I'm proud of this one because this perspective is so good. And there's a guy, what's his name? John Roman, who's an excellent artist and teaches perspective in the uh, Boston Art, the Boston School of Art. Always would call me when I did my perspective as well. He's a really good artist. He lives in situ as does his work. Bullfighting. But the, the thing that I like best to fool around with was politics. For instance, who is this guy? Oh, Ronald Ellis in Berlin. Uh, Tear down this wall back. Uh, now here's one. Remember a long time ago the Republicans had had a convention of people telling why they should be nominated for president. Now, we won't recognize those people unless they tell you who they are. Well, do you notice anybody? You see who? Newt Craig Rich, right? I gave him the first names. Uh, Mitt Romney is there, but it's easier to just tell you who they were. Newt Gingrich, John Huntsman, Ron Paul, Rick Perry, the guy I forgot what he was going to do, and uh, Mitt Romney and Rick Santoro. Now, what we used to do, we would print up coffee cups. We gave free coffee at Bill 19. We'd print up coffee cups with the name of the presidential candidates on it. 
and we would count the empty coffee, coffee cups to determine who was going to become president. And we would, we would reveal the results. And um, we did, well, oh, yes, I'm going to go back. Um, 19, 2008 election results, and these are, I like this because they had four opportunities to do caricatures. Obama, which got better. This, you know who this is? Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. Who's this guy? Our president. president? No, that's supposed to be Biden. Yeah. Not that great. Do you know who this is? That's supposed to be John Glenn. Well, then we had an inauguration, and the similar people were in the audience. You, you know who she is? Not very good picture on. You know who he is? Not very good. That's Sarah Palin. That's Obama. That's pretty good. Okay. Now, George Bush and George Cheney. Bush's vice president, Cheney. Cheney. You're going to fail when we get to the next one. You know what that is? That's supposed to be Jimmy Carter, and that is. What happened? I touched it. Um, that's all right. Once the election was over, it says back at something important, bargain shopping. Now, we say, how many real millionaires shop at Building 19? And you should be able to know these because they're all fictional characters. Well, all but two or three. We'll start with the easy ones. Do you know who this is? Richie Rich. Do you know who that is? Famous millionaire, real person. John D. Rockefeller. You know who that is. Billionaire. That's Oprah. Oprah. You know who that is? Daddy Warbucks. And little off and Annie. Uh -huh. Do you know who that's supposed to be? Bill Gates. Uh, no. Um, Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Okay. okay, this is the easy one. Who's that? Scrooge McDuck. Uh, Scrooge McDuck. Oh. Uh, who else? We got this guy is from Esquire magazine, if you remember, and that guy, of course, is from Monopoly. And who's this guy? Bill Clinton. Donald Trump. Oh, Donald. Now, at this point, I would like to, I used to like to draw caricatures of people that were good caricatures, but they were so obscure people, nobody would know what they were. So I could be right in both, and they could say, no, it's just like him, you just don't know who he is. So here's a bunch of obscure, uh, obscure people, not obscure, they're famous, sort of, and look at over, we're running close to time, so... I won't, well, maybe we will. Let's see what, see if you know, you know who that is. Big Poppy, you know who that is. No longer with us. Menino. Menino, you know who that is. America's Got Talent. That's what it's supposed to be. Um, let's see if somebody, you know who this is, the guys from Cambridge. Well, why don't I just give it away? Cameron Diaz, James Levine, who was, and Paul Pierce, you remember Paul Pierce. Um, the one that I liked the best was this guy down the bottom, which he is not buying anything, he's stealing stuff, and that's why he bothers him. And you remember Snooky? Uh, and I also like Celine Dillon. Anyway, what else? Anybody else did? William Shatner came out good. Well, we had a unique way of getting people to subscribe to our circular. We went into a mailer and we wanted to get their addresses. So it says, win a free live monkey to feed, care for, and dress up in Barbie's clothes. If you, it's a contest, and you have to send in your name, street address, state, and zip. And then you also say what you would like at the banquet. Roast beef, chicken, parmesan, vegetarian, lasagna, catch of the day. And you also have to say you're over 18 and can get stuff like this through the mails with nobody asking any questions. And people sent these back, which was great. We had a great mailing list. There's another way we got people to sign up. We put this ad in. If you don't sign up for our semi-precious mailing list, we're going to shoot this dog. All right? And it's, now it says attention, it's just a picture of a dog, we're not really going to shoot him, and after all, it's just a picture of a gun, it will never go off, there are even, you can't even see the bullets in it. It's a safe gun. It's, it, everything's safe here, nobody will get hurt. Well, that didn't prevent 
The dog lovers, and we live in situates, so you know what happened. The dog lovers rode in and they said a terrible thing, cruelty to animals. I'll never shop in that store again. So, of course, we went and I did it again. We're going to try something completely different. If you don't sign up for our mailing list, we'll set fire to this picture of a cartoon dog. And I went over and I said, it's not a real dog, it's just a picture of a dog. It's not a real match, it's a picture of a match. And so if we tried to light the match, it would never catch the picture of the dog on fire. So everything is going to be all right, but the letters came back. <laughs> uh, but the thing that we're most proud of is our promotions. And this is uh, the promotion I told you about the, when Kerry ran against Judge W. Bush, we printed up the coffee cups. And here's the two candidates drinking coffee after coffee so they would win the election. <laughs> then we promised to give, you know, here's the results, and we decided to win. Sure enough, Judge Bush won the election. He got the coffee cups. Yeah, we've never been wrong. We also promised everybody that came into the store a free lottery ticket, a scratch ticket. And there it was. I drove it up. And it says, scratch my back, please. Try to hit the right spot. It's driving me nuts. So this one says, lower. Then it says, lower it a little bit to the right. And this one says, ah. And we had it made up, and they really worked that way. And we gave them out, and people thought they were lottery tickets, and they didn't think it was funny. <laughs> Jerry, found, Jerry found an outfit that would make up counterfeit breakfast cereal. In other words, they make up breakfast cereal just like the real breakfast cereal, and they'd put it in a different box, any box you wanted to design. So we designed this box. And it had to be breakfast of cheapskates, jerry -O. And they were just like Cheerios. And we sold them for $1.49, which is way cheaper than the real Cheerios. It was great, except we got a letter from a lady that said, I'm not interested in eating a breakfast that Jerry has been bathing naked in. <laughs> well, now, how do you know he's naked? But I didn't argue with him. We kept at it. We told the story about the customer complaint, and we decided to have a contest. People could write in and say if, if they wanted to be on the Jerry's box instead of Jerry because that's disgusting. So we got Pat the Bat Piper, who was a budding wrestler. He won. He thought he would win it for sure. The old skater guy, which is an old guy that was a roller skater. We had Meredith and Missy, who were synchronized swimmers. Carol, the stay-at-home mom. And Miriam, the uh, it was an army navy wave, and she was like in her 80s. She was a lovely woman. These were really nice people. And we had the contest, and of course the customers rigged the contest. So the friends of the winner all wrote in, and we had to have a party, of course, to result, uh, announce the winner. So we hired the neighborhood club in Quincy, and had a big to do, and. There it is, the faces on the jerry box revealed, it's Meredith and Missy. And we printed this up, and there's me, and there's the beautiful, what's her name? Danielle, who modeled some of the clothes, and there's the people that were there, and we had a wonderful time. It's great. And there's the real, and we, we did it, and we, we sold them again. We also had, oh, this is, sometimes, some of the promotions didn't work very well. <laughs> the world's ugliest baby really wasn't particularly by a lot of people. It wasn't a great idea. Well, you hit, you hit some and you lose some. We also had the Building 19 fan club, and I can't show you any pictures, I couldn't find any. But we asked people to join the Building 19 fan club, and we pretended it was a real club. Well, it was sort of a real club. We would send them certificates each week, and we would send when they signed up and they could get something free at Building 19, stuff that we couldn't sell. And what we had a sweatshirt made up that said Building 19 Fan Club. And these, what was great about these promotions, they got totally out of hand. I mean, a normal store concerns with getting the stuff in, pricing them, putting on the shelves, and getting them out. That's what Building 19 is supposed to do. That's what 
sensible businesses do. No, no, no. We were going to have the Building 19 Fan Club, and we were going to the home show. We thought, it, one of the people thought it was a good idea to get a booth in the home show. So sure enough, we did, and we asked everybody that had the Building 19 um, sweatshirt to come to the home show. And a number of them did, and they went, whenever they came over to our booth, we made a huge thing about it. We blew horns and sent up balloons, and we made a big noise about it. Now the people in the home show, who are serious businessmen, went to the owners of the home show and said, we don't want to be next to those guys. They're making too much noise. We can't talk to our customers. They're, they're a bad influence. So we almost got thrown out of the home show. <laughs> Uh, that was a wonderful time. We went. We then went to a restaurant afterwards. Oh, we, don't talk. we went to a restaurant afterwards, and there was a guy in the restaurant way across the room, and he had his sweatshirt on. So we sent. We called the waitress over and said, "Take care of that guy." You know. Now, I said, "Don't, but don't tell it where it came from. Tell him you got this dinner because you wore your building 19." So now we got a guy who believes. That if he wears the Building 19 fan club t shirt, sweatshirt to restaurants, he'll get a free meal. <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> we had no idea who it was. Then we had the awful joke contest. We asked the people to send in the worst joke they'd ever heard. Well, that wasn't good enough. Now we had to decide who was going to win. And we, we didn't want to do it like we did before, where Meredith and Missy stacked the place. We said we were going to also have a contest of who was going to be a judge on the awful joke contest. And you have to send in your credentials. And people sent in all why they understand jokes and all. It was complicated. We had to read all these letters and follow them up and send a thank you, but you didn't make it. But we got nine people to come in. We went across the street to the Ocean Kai restaurant, right across from Building 19, which is sort of a dumpy Chinese restaurant. And we took over the whole place. And I wore my yellow suit. Now, it's a long story, but it's, this gives you an idea. These are true stories, by the way. Billy Nineteen got took in a, a uh, clothing store that was in the middle of Harlem, right next to the Apollo Theater, where the entertain, uh, entertainers would go to get their uniforms. Well, they had a silk suit that fit me perfectly. The only problem was it was yellow. It was blistering yellow with purple stripes. And it was a two-piece suit. It was, I mean, sport coat, it was a suit, a real suit. So I had to wear that to be to be the master ceremonies. And Jerry and I would read the jokes, and these nine people would write down numbers, and then we'd tally it all up. And we got the winner. And we published all the jokes in our joke book, which we published. The Billy 19 awful joke book, and the the I, I know you're asking, what's the most awful joke? Yeah. Well, the awful joke is, what is black and sticky? A stick. <laughs> That's why it's an awful joke. Nobody. <laughs> I think it was what they really should have won, don't you think? <laughs> now, one of the things that we were famous for building 19 and what people I think made it beloved is that we weren't afraid of using bad taste now in the world today has gone to hell because you cannot I saw a picture on the news the other day of a Picasso drawing right you know what Picasso stuff it's all and they blurred out the breasts you didn't know what it was the ears or the eyes on the feet, you didn't know what it was, but they didn't want to get the wrong idea. They didn't want to have bad taste. But the, the, the world is going to hell. This is crazy. It could be like that. And they blur out the pictures of people in, that have been arrested. What? They've been arrested. Let's see what they look like. Anyway, <laughs> for example, time flies like an animal. House flies like a turd. <laughs> That didn't win the dirty joke contest. <laughs> Here's one. Calling all hockey nuts. We're selling it. And it says, speaking of nuts, athletic support. 
I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> now, here's an ad that I did that I didn't think was in bad taste. Here's three guys standing on the street corner looking at this nice chick walking by with a Building 19 bag. And the first two guys are trying to figure out her measurements, and Jerry, of course, is trying to figure out how much money she's spending. I thought that was simple. Well, we got a call from a lady lawyer. Oh, and she said, she was very nice. She says, this is demeans women, that's a terrible, it objectifies women, you can't do this, and she gave me the whole story. I said, then we'll have to publish an apology. But I'm not going to write it, because I'm the one that wrote the first joke. You don't want me to write it, I want you to write it. She says, okay, I'll call you back. And she wrote it, and, she, and it was short and sweet, you can't read it, but that's what she wrote at the bottom. Now, I thought that was cool that you allow a customer to write an ad for you. I just thought that was really neat. Anyway, speaking of bad taste, uh, <laughs> we have a story in the news. Take a crack at it, all right? This is one of the early ones. It says, this evening's attraction has asked us to remind one and all that it is not the policy of this institution to take 100% off. <laughs> but since we also had Jerry's Follies, this, Jerry's Follies was a real thing. He had a table on Jerry's Follies, things that he bought that he couldn't sell. There was a stupid thing for him to buy, and there was quite a few things on that table. Anyway, we did that, and there in the front row of the bald-headed row. Here's my favorite, though, coming up. We got, I better go back, because I gotta, gotta set this up. I can't set it. We got this videotape. And the videotape was like the videotape they, they make you watch in junior high school about how a boy should always open the door for a girl and it's not nice to laugh in class. It, it, the most bull, you remember them, they, they were terrible. They would come in with the, with the stand and the video, the movie camera, and you'd say, good, I don't have to listen to that. And whatever it was, we loved them, but we never paid any attention to them. Well, they were just like that. They were terrible. This was a really stupid video. And he bought them, and he says, now we gotta sell them. Okay, so I have, I gotta walk over there, I hope I don't break myself over. Because this is brilliant copy. Maybe I have it here. No, I don't, I'm supposed to bring it in. Brilliant copy. <clears throat> so we put them out for sale for $1.98, and it says, says, Miss Rita LaFong, star of stage, screen, and adult video, and state certified practitioner of psycho, psycho aromatherapy and gender specific wellness, whatever that means. Um, before I seen this tape, Secrets About Men That Every Woman Should Know, I was just a housewife dragging the kids to their soccer games and the dance lessons and rushing home to get dinner on the table for Roscoe come home. Then a friend of mine lent me this awesome video and gave me a new, whole new leash on life. Needless to say, today I'm a powerful new age woman, successfully beyond my, successful beyond my wildest dreams in the boardroom and the bedroom, if you catch my drift. And Roscoe didn't know what hit him. Actual testimony from Ms. Rita LaFawn, celebrity spokesperson, role model, and motivational speaker in the all-around good kid. And it says, <coughs> after the International Obscene Contraband Act expired in 1996, these educational, in quotes, videos lay in a Tijuana warehouse for five long years until Brian, Brian Hickey, a traveling buyer who looks into things like this, rescued them for us. Now, 742 broad-minded people will be able to purchase this amazing video and allow it to change their lives like it changed readers. After viewing this crystal clear, full-color motion picture with on-the-spot recorded sound of actual people doing unusual things in this saucy video. And it goes on like that. And it says, but the other part says, like cigarettes and cheap wine, Explicit information is dangerous and should be kept away from minors struggling to escape the grasp of puberty. Small children, sizes 4 to 14, should, wouldn't understand anyway. So we're asking our clerks to be constantly on guard 
for youngsters trying to smuggle this tape out through the checkout without proper authority. And without, I might add, through $1.98. Now, people wrote in and they said, this is disgusting. You people are awful selling these type of things. And it sold out. Oh, no. And it came back. <laughs> everyone sold out and everyone came back. <laughs> Which everyone brought up because we had a 100% guarantee. If you didn't like it, you could bring it back within 30 days. So everyone brought it home. And I can imagine them watching it. You know, wait until the kids go to bed. <laughs> I think that would be funny. I, would, I can just would love to be a fly on the wall. But anyway, um, everybody does this. This is a true election. I don't know. Yeah, we made this all up. This isn't true. We made it all up that we, we won the we were best in South Boston. It wasn't true. And whenever we would dull, we would say we were voted the best. And sometimes it was true, sometimes it wasn't. But as all good things must come to an end, we finally had to go out of business. Now, the sad part about the going out of business aspect is that Jerry gave, it to, Jerry gave the business to his son, always a problem. When he gave his business to his son, his son didn't want to do it, but he couldn't say no to his mother and his father. So he planned for five years with his lawyers to go out of business. And if you do it right, Trump will tell you, if you do it right, you make money. You don't have to pay anybody, you don't, you, you, you don't pay taxes, it's a terrific thing. So he ran it into the ground, and the other thing is, they owned a lot of their locations. And so what they would do is they would raise the rent raise the rent, and they would take the rent in, because they owned it. For instance, I, when computers came in, they, we all got computers, and I found out what we would charge on our computers. We would charge monthly the price of a computer. My computer cost the price of a computer every month we had it, and that was for every other computer in the business. They also owned a business that rented out computers to businesses like us. In fact, only businesses like us, because nobody in their right mind would pay that. So they milked the thing dry, or the son milked the thing dry, and Jerry was beginning to lose it and uh, wanted to get out of it anyway. And the son, who, by the way, I can unshamedly say he was the most miserable human being I've ever met in my life, handsome young lad, but just a wicked jerk. Anyway, they were done, and Jerry used to drink um, which reminds me of another story. I <laughs> Jerry would stay at, in the beginning days of Building 19, we'd stay at late, he'd write the copy, and I would illustrate it, just the two of us, in the very early days. And Jerry would write great long copy, and it was a good copy. If you ever got the early circulars, it was fun to read, it was good stuff. Gee, you know, it was really good, he was sincere, he knew how to write, he wrote very well. And uh, it was funny, it was great. So he's. He's writing his stuff up, and I said to him, do you suppose anybody reads this stuff? He says, I don't know. I said, but we'll find out. And he had written this long thing, and he said, at this point, he said, and if you've written, read this far, bring this, cut this out, and bring it in, and we'll give you a quick new $10 bill. Said, That's a great idea. Great. But on the ride home, I began to think, and the next day, I walked in, and I said, Jerry, remember that $10 bill thing? We published 50,000 copies of that. He says, well, let's hope nobody reads it. And nobody read it. <laughs> so we were lucky. That's what we were, he was having his Jack Daniels. Anyway, this is the Say Goodbye to Jerry, and this is the back page of his daughter's book, which is available on um, Amazon. And that's Jerry and his book. And he was a really good guy, he was a witty guy, and he, I thank him to my last days of allowing me to be unsupervised for 40 years. And that dangerous. could never happen again. It, it just never would happen, especially when you have a guy that understood advertising and that liked to do it. Usually you run into someone that understands advertising and likes to do it, won't let you do it. They tell you what to do. And I'm in that position now. I do some advertising for people, but they're always telling you what would be funny. You don't want to say, that's not funny, that's stupid. 
if you want to be funny, you really got to be stupid, like we were. Well, we're almost done. There was a guy, recently, there was a guy by the name of Trip Underwood who started publishing this on Facebook and on all the other, I can't remember the name, Insta, Instagram. And, so he has a column or a, a weekly thing that he puts this on and he finds his friend of his went to the Globe and downloaded all the old Building 19 circulars. And he puts one cover on a week and comments on it. Makes, you know, makes comments and he's a really good guy. I invited him over the house. He came down and I gave him my hard drive that had everything that I've ever done in. I made a copy, of course, but we, now we're talking about maybe doing a book. And I think, I think it would sell. It would sell in this area. And that's the problem. If you go to a publisher today, they want to know, do you have something that will sell everywhere? And the answer is no. Nobody ever heard of Building 19. Oh, I have another story. I, I have to tell you this story. It's interesting. But this is my final. This is where we come to the intermission part of our show. We're going to be out of here by 8 o'clock, but I've got to tell you the story. In 1980, Jerry said, i got a job for you. He says, there's a guy down in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He said that he wants to start a business like ours. He's got a warehouse. And he says, I know the guy. He comes from Wayman. He says, go down. He'll pay your way down. Go down and show her how to make a circular. Do some caricatures. Straighten them out. Tell them how to do ads. And come back and he'll pay you. So I said, okay, I'll go down. And I went down. I landed on a Friday. He, the guy, it was Mort Bernstein from, uh, what is it? The uh, a lumber company that was over in England. Grossman's. He was a vice president of Grossman's. But he's living in Pennsylvania now. So we, I did caricatures of the, the president, the, the him and his partner and all the people. And I showed pictures. Did the same thing like he paid me, I went home, and I forgot about it. Forty years go by. Forty years go by. And I'm watching the Red Sox recent, relatively recently. And behind the Red Sox comes up an ad that says, Ollie's Bargain Outlet. I said, I did that cartoon 40 years ago. So I called the guy up and said, we ought to do some business. He said, oh, yeah. So he gave me some stuff to draw, and I drew some of the original beginnings of Ollie's Bargain Outlet. And they finally came, and, they, and when Building 19 went broke, they bought good stuff cheap, the words, good stuff cheap. And he bought some of the other stuff. So I went to, and they have a store down in Plymouth. And when they opened it up, we went down, and I told them who I was, and I, everyone thought it was wonderful. But they never asked me to go down. They didn't open them like we opened stores, where I would go to the stores and do caricatures of anybody that wanted to come by, and we'd put on one of the things, we opened the place over in Hingham, it was slow when we started, and we couldn't figure out why until Rocco, one of the guys, says it's too clean. He took out all the, half the lights and they took dirt, threw it all over the place, and sales went up. Anyway, I got a million of these stories, but I had to tell you that one. And I think that's it. I want to thank Ricky for bringing me a Yahoo magazine that I have not seen in 60 years. This is the, uh, this is the um, humor magazine at the University of Massachusetts. And we had a wonderful time putting that together with a bunch of other guys. And I did the cover, which shows a graduate looking at the ward ads. And um, we had a wonderful time. Until, but we, shot, we drew a picture. I didn't draw this picture, but one, one of the artists did. It's a picture of Beacon Hill, the, the dome of the Beacon Hill. Except the dome looked like a person's naked rear end, <laughs> if you can imagine. Well, that came out the day that we, the president was entertaining people from the state house. <laughs> and they closed it down. They closed down a magazine. That was only around for a couple of years. But we were very proud of it. We did a good. Now, are there any questions? By the way, welcome to the senior center. <laughs> um, are there any questions before we go? Well, you've been a wonderful audience, and thank you very much for your kind attention. I have a question. 